Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the Eclipse viewing. What a fantastical event. I'm Tamiko Brown-Nagan, Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this year's Kim and Judy Davis Dean's Lecture in the Arts, titled Creative Climate Action, Can Art Protect Us from Rising Seas? Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, Xavier Cortada, let me take a moment to thank Kim and Judy Davis, whose support makes this lecture series possible. I'm also grateful to the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our annual donors. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. As the planet warms, sea level rise presents an urgent threat to communities around the world. According to a recent analysis by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, U.S. coastlines are likely to experience anywhere from 3.5 to 7 feet of sea rise by the year 2100 as a result of a combination of historical and future fossil fuel emissions. These projections underscore how sea level rise is already happening and if we don't take collective action to dramatically reduce greenhouse emissions in the years to come, it's likely to get much worse. Rising sea levels are likely to alter the landscapes of many low-lying U.S. cities, including Miami, Florida, the place Xavier calls home. In her recent book, Charleston, Race, Water, and the Coming Storm, my colleague at Harvard Law School, Susan Crawford, underscores the gravity of the issue, arguing that coastal cities must begin preparing for the prospect that densely populated residential areas will be rendered unrecognizable by rising seas. She writes, quote, someday, not too long from now, the stories of many current coastal and riverside cities will include sudden plot twists, as well as new beginnings, as edges that had seemed solid liquefy and become indistinguishable indistingu from the seas around them. Those hit hardest by these upheavals are likely to be low-income people of color, many of whom live in areas that are particularly susceptible to flooding. Nor is this threat limited to the US. The United Nations Refugee a Agency emphasizes that climate change is already contributing to the displacement of people worldwide, making it harder to protect, quote, a broad array of human rights, including the right to education, adequate standard of living, and health. According to this same agency, 40% of refugees live in countries that are highly susceptible to flooding and other climate-related disasters. Our speaker today is uniquely positioned to comment on the threats of sea level rise and to guide us in thinking collectively about how to address this threat. The child of Cuban exiles, Xavier Cortada grew up in Miami and went on to receive a BA, JD, and Masters of Public Administration from the University of Miami before becoming a full-time artist. He currently serves as professor of the practice in the University of Miami's Department of Art and Art History and as the inaugural artist in residence for Miami-Dade County. In 2023, he received the Excellence in Science Communications Award from the Na National Academies of Science, Engineering, and medicine. Xavier has commented that science is, quote, his muse. His interdisciplinary art aims to increase public awareness of scientific advances and to stimulate conversation about social issues. In 2013, he collaborated with CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland, to create five murals that were inspired by the five experiments through which scientists demonstrated the existence of the so-called God particle, Higgs boson. 
Other projects have been informed by the scientific consensus that global warming is real and made worse by human activity. For instance, as a National Science Foundation Antarctic Artists and Writers Fellow, Xavier created a work called The 150,000 Year Journey, in which he placed a replica of a mangrove seedling into glacial ice at the South Pole. As we speak, this seedling is journeying across Antarctica at a rate of roughly 10 meters annually and should reach the ocean in 150,000 years. This piece addresses some of the core concerns of Xavier's work, including the experience of immigrants and the question of what our planet will look like in the distant future. Today, we have the opportunity to learn about how Xavier uses art to spur action around sea level rise. We are honored to have him with us here this afternoon. After his remarks, Xavier will be joined in conversation by my colleague, Gina Kim, who is the Johnson Kulikandis Family Faculty Director of the Arts here at Radcliffe and the George Bickford Professor of Indian and South Asian Art and Professor of South Asian Studies at Harvard. Gina is the author of two books, Receptacle of the Sacred, Illustrated Manuscripts and the Buddhist Book Cult in South Asia, and Garland of Visions, Color, Tandra, and a Material History of Indian Painting. Following Xavier and Gina's conversation, we'll open the floor to questions. Whether you're watching us in person or online, you can submit questions at any time using the Slido link that is provided on the screen behind me and posted in the chat feature of the Zoom webinar. I'm thrilled to have both Xavier and Gina with us today. And now please join me in warmly welcoming Xavier Katata to the stage. Can art protect us? Can it save us? Can it help us reclaim our humanity? I, I think so. In many ways, I think it helped shape our humanity. It definitely was responsible for allowing us to build our civilization, our sense of who we are. And today, it gives meaning to our lives in every way. Art is the most intimate of human experiences. And if it can make us, and if it can help us build our civilization, then I think it can help save them, save us from ourselves, and save our society. It's my pleasure to be with you here today. I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here at the Kim and Judy Davis Dean's Lecture, and to be with you today in fellowship, and I look forward to your questions and discussions about the role of art. Art actually helped me navigate through the issue of climate change. It was the vehicle I used to explore art and to work and learn with my community to better understand the consequences, the impact that climate is having on my community. And I remember doing that specifically <clears throat> in Antarctica through the National Science Foundation as an Antarctic artist and writers fellow. I remember being there embedded with scientists, glaciologists who were studying the human impacts on our climate. And of course, we're sharing our meals together in the mess hall, we're interacting with one another, we're engaging in fellowship. And those scientists helped explain to me just how vulnerable we were. This is back in 2006. They shared with me samples of their research, pieces of ice from the Western Antarctic ice sheet, sea ice, right off Ross Island. And I took those pieces to McCrary Lab, a marine lab at the bottom of the station at McMurdo Base, and I melted them. Outside my window, there were the Transantarctic Mountains. I could see them. In front of me were the very materials that helped shape that topography. And I took them and melted them on pieces of sketch paper. Just literally started melting, put some of the pigment I had brought for the paintings I was supposed to create, and watched them melt. And those paintings looked almost like satellite imagery of Antarctica, right? These blue pigments, melted ice with sediments. 
they were clearly made in Antarctica, with Antarctica, but they weren't about Antarctica. They were about where Antarctica was going. They were about the precursor of horrors to come to my community. This is the only place I've ever called home. This is Miami. And this is what Miami looks like with six feet of sea level rise. Scientists tell us that by the end of this century, if we continue business as usual, Miami will drown. It is an urgent matter. It is an existential crisis. It is the issue of our time. But in Miami, I don't see that sense of urgency the same way I don't see it in Tallahassee or Washington or at any of our COP meetings. I see a business community that is interested in its bottom line, interested in its quarterly earnings, interested on the return of investment, interested in how they are going to make their investors happy, extracting, exploiting, polluting to ensure that those investors are happy, all while ushering in the destruction of the very planet that contradicts the very happiness of those investors that they aim to please. And government isn't any better. I don't see government's responsiveness to this kind of crisis. I mean, it's literally an attack on our coastlines, on our security, on our ecosystems, on the way of life. But it's not treated with the urgency that this moment calls for. Again, politicians are elected every two or four years. They're incentivized by the actions they take in that electoral time period. But they're also influenced by big oil, the undue influence of big oil that not only clouds the way they act, but deceives the constituents who put them in office. I look at the faith community. I look at the faith community that prays about the sanctity of life, all the while our society is complicit in destroying life. And I'm not just talking about the sixth mass extinction. I am talking about the collapse of nation states. I'm talking about chaos, climate migration. I'm talking about the famine, hunger, suffering that our fellow citizens are to endure, not just in Miami, but in every place where land touches water. And I see silence. I see silence from our faith community in face of this great unethical and immoral issue. I see silence. I look at education, at academia, hoping to find a solution there. I see us stuck in our silos. We talk about interdisciplinarity. But at the end of the day, we are driven by what funds us. At the end of the day, we're in the petty squabbles of academic politics. We look at our community as human subjects, not as people with wisdom and capacity to help us problem solve. I'm disillusioned in many ways by that. So then I look at the cultural community, hoping to find this space where we could have an openness, the very place that helped build our society, that helped shape our humanity. And I see problems there as well. I look at institutions that are ready to talk about it, but only if their donors approve. I see the back of the house not walking the walk, the front of the house maybe showing an exhibit or a dance. That is akin to the greenwashing that any big oil company would do to check off the fact that they addressed climate. I look at the most powerful tool that we have, the arts, as a solution to help bring us together, but find that too many 
too often allow its own self-preservation and interest to defy its role in preserving all of us. And I decry that self-absorbed, selfish response in face of the collapse of everything we love and care about. If we really believed that this was a climate emergency, if we really believed that billions would perish, would we not use the very tools that we use to capture and witness a moment to stop that horror from happening? Would we not use the power of art to bring us together, to convene, to reframe, to stop the catastrophe that we are sitting here trying to alarm others about? It's not just our ecologies that are collapsing. It's not just monocultures replacing the diversity of ecosystems, of old growth forests that have the medicine, that have the biology that can help prevent and cure diseases not yet found. It's not just our marine life being depleted. It's not just our ecosystems crumbling as wetlands become bulldozed, as coral reefs become bleached, but it's also our very democracies that are crumbling. It's our way of engaging and interacting with one another. And I believe that now is the time for us as society to understand that the arts, that the power of art, that our inherent creativity can be part of that solution. In Miami, <clears throat> It's not just about what happens at the coastline. This is an environmental just justice issue of what happens to the people of Miami. As you look at this picture, you see the menacing rising seas coming to a shoreline, but you also see skyscrapers and cranes of any coastal city. The sadness of it is that if you are someone working inland and you see the buildings going up, you assume that there's some person with wealth who has the know-how, the knowledge, the capacity to build at the water's edge. So the problem probably isn't that bad. All these environmentalists and scientists probably are engaged in a hoax. This person isn't stupid. They wouldn't be building at the water's edge. Why should I be sacrificing or voting or concerned about the issue, not understanding that that's a completely different roulette table they're gambling with, not understanding that the developer who's building at the water's edge gets their return as soon as the condos are sold in a year or two, not understanding that the people buying those condos aren't buying it for their home to embed themselves in community, to be part of the fabric that helps our community thrive. It's a third or fourth home, it's play money. And it's a good place to park your money and investment because you're going to flip that in two or five years. But society at large, the same society that's impacted because property values continue going up because the Achilles heel of climate change and sea level rise isn't impacting the decision making of the real estate purchases. In fact, it's helping blow up that real estate bubble. Because of that, we have this blind spot. And the people living inside in homes that are in neighborhoods that don't have the tax base of a financial district, that don't have the tax base of a tourism district, that don't have the high density, aren't going to be able to adapt, aren't going to be able to have pumps pumping the water out as the seas rise aren't going to be able to have their roads go higher because the money isn't there in those communities. And those communities will become the water reservoirs in the shorter term. But again, that's an invisible matter. 
So as an artist, I do my best to try to make those invisible things visible. And that's the reason I created The Underwater. The Underwater is a community-led climate action campaign that uses interactive art installations to reveal South Florida's elevations to rising seas, its vulnerability to rising seas, to spark climate conversations, and to urge civic engagement. I did that because I was inspired by hurricanes. Whenever there's a hurricane in Miami-Dade, everyone moves. Everything stops. You're, you're putting up your shutters. You're going to Home Depot and buying all the plywood. Everyone's hoarding and taking the water. But everyone is mobilized. Everything stops, and all are in, looking at that three, four-day track, seeing what's going to happen to the hurricane. Is the eye of the hurricane going to hit Miami? And even if it does, everyone knows that FEMA will protect you, and the water will recede. But there's a storm that's coming called sea level rise, where the water will not recede. It will hit all land at all time, and there is no FEMA to save you. But no one's doing anything about it. So I thought, to try to let people understand that sea level rise was happening. I tried to explain to them what the scientists in Antarctica had shared with me. Of course, I had created these ice paintings. That's what I did, it's to raise awareness, to break through, to warn them about the problem. They were actually the literal depiction of melting ice. They were the literal depiction of what was going to be coming to your front yard. It's literally the water that was going to arrive at your doorstep. But I wanted to do something that would make the issue a little bit more personal. I wanted to find a way of bringing it to your doorstep. So I decided to take those Antarctic ice paintings and use them as the backdrop for yard signs. Yard signs that people would put in their front homes. I needed to make it personal to them, so using an app, I had people type in their address and they would discover how many feet above sea level that address was, how many feet above sea level the homes were. And then they would take that number and they would draw it on a yard sign and have the courage to put it in their front yard. In many ways, it was Antarctica coming to town. And this wasn't the for sale sign. This wasn't a, a vote for me sign. This wasn't an even you know, get, keep your dog off my lawn sign. This was this sort of ambiguous sign with a number on it that made you want to do a double take, that made you want to ask, what is this number doing here? What it was, it was an opportunity for individuals to take responsibility for something that, prior to that, they thought wasn't their issue. Well, those are the people living on the coast. Or something that they thought was someone else's problem to solve. But over here, they were the eco-emissaries. They were the ones literally telling the neighbor across the street who was curious about what that weird blue sign in your yard was, that that sign depicted the elevation of their property and that they should probably be interested in understanding the human impacts on climate and how our planet was warming. I used this campaign to do a series of other things. I engaged the community in in problem solving by having them literally depict the elevation of several intersections across Miami-Dade County. Coupled with the thousands of yard signs and these intersections, we made sea level rise impossible to ignore. You couldn't walk around without someone seeing or talking about this sign created by, placed by, the very citizens who would be discussing what had happened. And it was an important effort because it also helped visualize some important data. People assumed that the farther away you were from the coastline, the safer you were. That kind of makes sense. Not realizing that flat Miami, our top elevation, is 20 feet above sea level. That's our, that's our high elevation, unless you, you count the landfill, which is 10 times higher. But our highest natural elevation is 20 feet above sea level. But there's a ridge. And on the other side of the ridge, we have this thing called the River of Grass, the Florida Everglades. 
So by creating a series of these intersections going from east to west, we showed that initially the numbers were lower and then they would go higher. But eventually, after you hit the coastal ridge, the numbers would start diminishing. Using engaged art created by community to make it personal and to have people understand what their climate vulnerability was. This role, this role of using art to engage folks in the making isn't just about my belief in art, but it's about having us believe in ourselves and our role in the, pro in the creative problem solving. In fact, the most important aspect of this project was the convenings. We created the nation's first underwater homeowners association, where we would host community meetings, right? Not talking about the paint color of your house or how tall your grass is, but it's literally talking about the issues of what's going to happen when groundwater is high, what's going to happen to our septic tanks, what's going to happen to insurance rates, what happens to our tax base and our property values, right? Trying to bring in experts and having conversations between experts and community leaders to talk about and discuss the future, a future, with rising seas. And when COVID hit, we pivoted and we started having our meetings on Zoom. I don't know if you remember back then, but you would create these little panels in the background for Zoom, right? Back in the day, it was a big novelty. So we had people create their own uh, panels of their own elevation so that whenever they would be on a Zoom call, someone would ask, what's that number eight behind you? And to me, it's this process of engaged creativity where we enc encourage collective action through the art making, where we believe in people's own ability to understand, we, we have enough faith in individuals that if they understand their vulnerability that they will do something about it, prompted us to create all sorts of interventions. Some of them were outside museums, others of them at art fairs, where we'd have large scale installations. On the upper right, it's our latest installation during Art Basel Week, right at the water's edge, five feet above sea level, next to one of the art fairs under a pretty tent. Inside the art fair, you have art, selling for $300,000. Outside the art fair, you have a sign making art democratic and accessible, showing people the very vulnerability of the barrier island upon which Miami Beach was built and having us have a better understanding of it. In all of these activities, there's always a conversation, always a convening, always an invitation for people to come together and learn more and learn from one another, learning together and working together. And then we innovate, in this case, when we do our canvassing, it isn't going door to door to knock on the door to have people vote for someone. In this case, it's going door to door and having people understand what their elevation is. The yard sign we ask you to put up isn't one about a political candidate, but it's about your own climate vulnerability. In many ways, I believe that it is imperative for us to be able to do this, not just in cultural spaces, but I think we need to bring that into our educational arenas too. I think we need to look at education from a foundational face and look at the real world challenges that middle school students are going to inherit by the time they get to be my age. And I think that socially engaged art projects like the ones I've just described to you create spaces for purpose-driven experiential learning, ultimately cultivating individuals with holistic, ecologically aware worldviews, and instilling foundational learning skills such as curiosity and self-efficacy. I went back to my alma mater, Miami High, Miami's first school, 40 years after I graduated, and I decided to bring the underwater to them. Miami High has had a bunch of iterations. When I was there, it was dubbed Havana High, because most of us were kids of Cuban refugees. Then it was Managua High and Tegucigalpa High. Through the years, it's sort of that conveyor belt slash incubator that brings Latin America into Miami and allows the enclave that has been built there to support different immigrant groups as they make their way into the American dream. And I, um, I went back there and I brought the project to them. And we started by trying to pique their curiosity. We asked them to put yard signs everywhere talking about 
you know, what is your number? And at first, it was a small group of students we worked with, sort of like the leaders of the, uh, of, of the group, who put these signs, in, and the kids had no idea what it was about. They thought it was about their cell numbers, so they started putting their cell numbers in the posters. But what we did is we engaged them in this process, right? Making it weird enough so that they would do a double take, so they'd be curious about it, so they'd be intrigued. And then we engaged every single science student, 2,000 students in that class, with a 90-minute session. That wasn't just about talking about climate. I did this through my foundation. Uh, the Cortada Foundation is here, and you'll see, learn more about it in the signs you'll get where we not only told them about the issue of climate, but made them the protagonist and the emissaries and the people who would find out about their elevation, but then take those markers, all 2,000 of them, and put them all over Little Havana and plant them in their community. They were the experts on their block about climate. And they had this conspicuous blue sign so that when Abuelita came over and asked, what's that number 10 doing in our front lawn? They would be able to talk about climate change to Abuelita or to the neighbor across the street or to their parents. They were able to convey what they had learned collectively and as part of an art project, something bigger than the traditional. And one of my proudest moments as a practitioner was this. This was the students from Miami High who took the initiative to get some shopping carts, load them with yard signs, and go up and down Calle Ocho, up and down the Merchant Avenue where the bodegas are, up and down 8th Street where no one talks about climate. And they went from merchant to merchant, telling them about what they had learned, and asking those merchants in the middle of Little Havana to put signs about climate in their doors. And they were able to do this because this wasn't an ideological issue. This wasn't the political campaign. These were their grandchildren. This was their merchants, right? These are, I mean, the, 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 the people who, who would uh, you know, buy from them coming to their doors and saying, look, this is an issue, and we want you to put a sign up. So using art as a vehicle to disarm, to connect, to build a sense of community is what we did in a place that didn't even want to have a conversation about climate. In, in my view, I'm trying to use art to create a platform or a process that creates a cadre of creative, empathetic, science literate problem solvers who, with empathy and love for community, are given the skills early on to be able to tackle our greatest challenges. I see art as liberator. I see art as having a role that can reawaken our human spirit, that can give a sense of purpose again, and that can help us again understand what it means to be human in a time where we walk away from a problem because we think it's too daunting. You know, when, when, a, when a kid, this has happened to me so many times, like a parent comes and shows me a little drawing that their child has made. It's a beautiful drawing. And they look at it and say, this will be worth something someday. Like, there's, there's incredible value to the drawing as commodity, as look at what my child can produce, instead of understanding the real value there, that some eight-year-old had the ability to use some crayons and a piece of paper to imagine something beautiful and different, to be creative. Instead of worrying so much about the, in, the tangible object that was made and whether or not this kid's going to be an art star, how awesome we were to value the ability, the creativity of that child to problem solve, to see things differently, to bring different pieces and people together to address issues. And they're going to need to. Because every single kid in this Broward County school, the county just north of Miami, faces this future. I don't want them to be concerned about art as commodity. I want them to understand that art is about connection. 
which is why we delivered a thousand of these yard signs across ten of these Broward schools. And my foundation created murals in every school depicting the elevation of that school. And by marshalling these 100 students that we worked with directly in every school, had the ability to have every single kid in that school know the elevation of their school, something that no one knows about. Please understand that no one understands or cares about elevation or sea level rise or climate, because all you have to do is go on Zillow and see how property values are twice what they were just a few years ago. No one's understanding the threat to climate. But if you can begin to use art to show that, and you can find other creative ways of working across institutions to communicate those ideas, or to serve as a catalyst for action. In this, way, in this particular way, the Broward County effort is something that's funded through not just the Department of Resiliency and a local community foundation, but art in public places. The folks who deliver the objects that usually are permanent through this initiative partnered to create process art, community engaged art, eco art, art that would address the future of Broward County to create that cadre of citizens. And again, using art as a place to convene, to bring people together, I have another project that I created in this case to try to inspire a polluter so big that if they were a country, they'd be the third largest polluter. And I'm talking about the concrete industry, responsible for about 8% of the carbon in the atmosphere. Because they have to use a lot of energy to produce carbon, I'm sorry, to produce concrete that is pure and isn't going to have the steel corrode. But over here, we're creating these elevation markers made out of sustainable concrete with fiberglass instead of metal rebar so the impurities can stay. We actually make it with salt water. But importantly, through art, we're giving a platform for the concrete industry to be able to showcase this innovative way of making concrete across 287 parks in Miami-Dade County. So the important thing is that we're incentivizing an industry to find some climate solutions by using the creativity of art to showcase that. And clearly, to reach out to people across all stretches, particularly that western fringe of Miami-Dade County where they may not be aware of their vulnerability, that they are indeed susceptible to sea level rise. In fact, it is through these installations that someone tossing a ball with their kid at a park can happen upon this weird thing with a number 10 on it and using a QR code understand that their park is at 10 feet above sea level rise, but also find out their home's elevation and understand their climate vulnerability too. They also become areas for placemaking. We usually have a ritualistic process where we invite people to it. In this case in park, in a park in South Dade, we invited some elderly citizens who shared their collective wisdom. These are people who struggled during the civil rights era to keep their communities intact and are now suffering from climate gentrification because their community is just a little higher at nine feet above sea level. And they're wondering why all these condos are being built next to their homes. Well, through art, we could inspire them, these elderly seniors coming to a senior center, to use the skills that they have built through their lives to once again fight for their neighborhood, to once again have a sense, to have the dignity and the respect of someone with wisdom and power to be able to communicate ideas and help save their society. And that's the power, that's the value that art brings to these conversations. And in every one of them, there's always a way of having different layers. When you put a yard sign in your house or when you see a bus going by or when you go to one of these parks, there's a QR code that prompts you to find out your elevation. So anyone, without ever meeting me, you know, you can go there and type your yard sign, type your address, and, and, and there's places where you can come and get your yard sign, where there's even ways of you creating your own. And then importantly, we ask you to begin to take action. Again, if you know that 
Sea levels will rise up to seven feet by the end of the century if we do nothing. And you just discovered that your home is at five feet above sea level, the home that you're working every day on so that your daughter can inherit it. Wouldn't you write your state representative and say, hi, scientists tell us that sea levels will rise by seven feet at the end of the century. My home sits at five feet. What are you doing about it? I mean, if it was that personal, if it really impacted the thing that you value the most, that has the most worth, and the person you love the most, your progeny, you'd act. And that's what we do with these projects, where we try to have people understand their climate vulnerability and then give them tools where they can just, not just contact an elected official, but then, with their curiosity, learn more and get involved. We give them local groups that they can volunteer with. And then we even have an intel section where they can learn more about the project. To me, art has an incredible role of breaking down barriers and bridging divides and giving people a sense of agency. So all of a sudden, you're not just understanding the issue, but you're advocating and being part of the solution. And of course, it's important for me to break across the spectacle that society has created that normalizes all of the pollution and climate disruption that exists. So I try my best to also work with mass media to communicate these ideas so that the broader society understands. And sometimes I do bizarre things, like go to every, the 54 coastal city halls across a peninsula, a state whose boundaries are shaped by water, and put yard signs in front of those city halls, the very place where they do land regulation, the very place where they decide what they're going to do with their tax base. And I put yard signs warning people about the elevation of that city hall, asking the people who sit on that dais to take those issues into account as they deliberate on whether or not to build housing on a place that a hurricane destroyed a decade earlier. Something that, obviously, Ian witnessed in the very path of Charlie. All of these are processes to help build an engaged citizenry that isn't deceived, that isn't duped, that isn't polarized across issues that wedge and divide us. And I believe in the ability of art to do that. I believe in our ability to understand our shared vulnerability and convey it to one another, just as I did during one of those COP meetings when I wanted us to understand that retreating to our sense of selfish survivalism was a deplorable way to express our humanity. And you see nation states do that when they talk about, well, unless they do this, we won't do that, thinking that the artificial boundaries that we create on a map somehow respect what carbon and climate will do to the people living in those spaces. Over here at COP, I, I wanted people representing their nations not to think about the interests of their nation states, but instead of to think about the humanity and to think about the impact and what they could do at Glasgow to address the issue of climate. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Today I'm inviting you to um, create your own very yard sign, to, to make a yard sign by taking your phone out and um, scanning that code. That'll take you to the location where you uh, can put your elevation, your home address. Now, I understand that I'm in Boston, and some of you are coastal, but some of you live a little bit upland, and some of you even higher upland. So not all of you are going to have um, that elevation. For those of you who live higher than 100 feet, the number that you get is going to ask you to move your decimal two points. So um, it should be pretty obvious to you if you're at 103 feet. And then there's going to be some markers going around. And I'm just asking you to find a, a way to just mark those 
markers the same way that I uh, have the students mark it. I ask them to, to bring their creativity to the conversation, to put a little bit of themselves in those, in those markers. I know some of you are going to be at 200 or 100 feet. And even as you write that, just to raise that awareness, to understand that there are parts of this community that are vulnerable, and that something as simple as putting a yard sign in front of your house to pique curiosity, to spark conversations, and to be a catalyst for people to respond would be important. If you happen to be part of institutions that have a little bit more capacity, look at something as simple as this as a, an approach that you can take to address in this issue of creative problem solving. Most people don't respond because they fear that it's not their problem. That lack of empathy is something we try to tackle. Others don't respond because they think the problem is too big and someone else will take care of it, either technology down the future or government. And others do care and understand the problem is big, but don't think that they have anything to do with it. And what I create to these processes is a platform that gives you the agency so that you yourself can be part of the solution. There needs to be a shift, I think, from passive consumption to cultural production. There needs to be a time where we just can't numb ourselves by binging on Netflix and lull ourselves into thinking that things are fine as an escape instead of moving forward and proactively trying to solve an issue. I think that what we do or fail to do today is going to echo through time. It's going to echo through history. And I, I believe that artists, I believe that artists can lead us and help us find the courage to break through, the courage to lead, the courage to speak, the courage to act. But I don't want to stifle what it means to be an artist or to put it in a box or to limit it. Art isn't only about expression. It's not a tool to express ourselves. Art is a weapon. It is a weapon against apathy and it is a weapon against despair. And we in society, all of us in society, were born with that weapon. Some of us have been conditioned. We are scared to use it, because that's what artists do, and we're not artists. We need to liberate art. We need to free ourselves. And we need to use the tool that made us who we are to save us from what we're becoming. It could not be more dire than it is now. Billions, billions will suffer. And the thing that gives me hope are my favorite species, human beings, if they use their full potential. And that potential includes the creativity that they use to create the paths of their lives, to create what they do with their beings, with their time on this planet. I just want them to use that creativity to create a better life for all of us. Thank you very much.
just really quickly, I'd love to be able to see all those yard signs come up a second, see what those numbers are. I see a 32, a 9.2, a 14, a four. Oh wow, that's a, a 22. Is that a 1.3? Oh my God, a 1.3. A 21, a 15, an 11. Boston, you need the underwater. A 10.2, 21. So these are some of the issues that we're trying to resolve. There's a toolkit here. If you click on that toolkit, you'll be able to download it and in your own neighborhood bring the underwater just by yourself to that toolkit. And if you need any further information, you're more than welcome to contact or connect with me and my foundation. So, my God, did you see those numbers? They were surprising, yeah, weren't yeah. they? No, mine is 12, so <laughs> pretty low. <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, thank you, really, for sharing your project and um, actually making the art sign together. And uh, again, my name is Gina Kim, and well, it's exciting to see how you inspire people, different communities of people to come together and act, actually. I have been thinking a lot about the arts role in um, addressing the climate changes, a uh, climate anthropogenic climate crisis, uh, starting with curating an exhibition titled Water Stories, River, uh, which has a long subtitle, River Goddesses, Ancestor Rights, and Climate Crisis which was held at the Johnson Klukundis Gallery, Family Gallery of Art on Har uh, Harvard Radcliffe Institute campus. And I would actually um, ask you to go to the Water Stories exhibition website and share your own water stories. That's also yeah. really about uh, cultivating climate empathy. So I, I do hope you'll join there as well. So I do firmly believe that artists' visions and material inter interventions can help make us see and understand the beyond human scale of climate change. And while as a scholar and as a curator, I merely hope to inspire an action, I'm just so impressed by how you really, as a socially engaged eco-artist, you're able to mobilize and generate action. And I mean, with your training and sort of experience in multiple disciplines, you have advanced degrees in public administration and law, um, I know you wear many hats, and I could actually call you by different titles. I can call you climate activist. You, I can call you just cultural leader. Uh, you know, you are uh, sit on different boards and councils, but you identify. You seem to, I, from, from my yeah. sort of understanding, you seem to identify yourself as an artist foremost. Absolutely. So I know you've been talking about this, but I actually want to kind of probe this further. That what is art to you? How did you become an artist, in a way? Can you tell us a bit about your trajectory and why, why art in person in your vision? Sure. So look, I think as I, I was having a wonderful conversation with uh, Harvard students at lunch today. And what a, what a wonderful time that was to, to interact with your students, an interdisciplinary group. And I talked a little bit about the power and the importance of, uh, of art as this interstitial space, right, where different people can come together and, and find new ways of seeing and thinking, and get out of our own silos, our own jargon, and begin to express ourselves and think differently. And I think that aperture that's created through the arts is a, is a, is a really, really important um, aspect of what leads us to innovation and creativity. For me, art never was about commodity. I'm the son of Cuban refugees. My father came to this country in 62. He was 21 years old with his brother. And they were artists. But their art was uh, about building community at a time where there was incredible uncertainty about whether they would be going back to Cuba, where they were staying. Art was a place that they used to convene poets and have tertulias, conversations. It was a place where you would provide refuge for new refugees coming in. So art was a really powerful tool for community building. So I have always, you know, and as a kid I learned, you know, to paint and to, you know, to love art through them. And then I went on to the, you know, to the Miami High School and to the university. Uh, but it was during really difficult times in Miami. This was the, high school was 82. So, you know, that's the time of the 
of the drug wars. It was a murder capital of the United States. It was time of race riots in Miami. So I, uh, I remember working back then as, a, as, a, as an orderly at a public hospital and seeing the gunshot wounds and seeing the burn victims and seeing the Haitian refugees who had uh, suffered violence, and they were all literally there at the ward. And as a young man, as a 16, 17 year old, they decided to lean into those problems. So you can see the, the beginnings, right? The makings of a, of a socially engaged artist, someone who sees art not as commodity, but as a way of building community, someone who sees community problems and leans into them, volunteers. Over time, I was appointed, well, by the time I was in law school, to chair the city's youth gang task force. I had, during law school, helped create a drug rehab center with the Jesuits in Miami, and little by little, was understanding that we had a responsibility for one another. So it's in that milieu, right, as a, as a person who's understanding that um, there are troubles to face and that art has a wonderful way of bringing them together that um, found me invited by the U.S. embassies as a, as a recent law school grad. I was a director of juvenile violence and delinquency prevention programs at the University of Miami in the Department of Psychiatry. So the United States Information Service has these programs where they take guest lecturers to go across and talk uh, and train other trainers and you know, sort of share the knowledge that we developed. So I did that all over Latin America, over Central America, Bolivia during uh, uh, th that moment, Colombia during Pablo Escobar's time. There I was talking about drug prevention in Colombia. Uh, but eventually uh, got to, uh, which is kind of weird, uh, but got to, got to uh, South Africa in 1994. And I was at the Ipeleg Center just a few months after apartheid had ended. Again, I'm a, a research assistant professor at the University of Miami. I'm there wearing my tie, uh, talking to these kids who were listening to a drug violence expert. And I wasn't connecting with them because they were speaking a Zulu dialect and I had a translator. So we decided to start drawing, just using art as a way of disarming. And I think it's really in that moment, um, in October of, of, of 94, where art wasn't a hobby, where art was really more than a visual aid, where art was this incredible, powerful tool and process. That was 30 years ago, right? That was 30 years ago. And a powerful tool and process that I could use to really Help. So that my initial career went in the direction of working with kids in adult prison, working uh, with our juvenile justice system, working with Mothers Against Drunk Driving, uh, working all over Latin America on, uh, with street children, using art to amplify voices, to convey ideas, right? Uh, and over time, that pivoted to the crisis that's in front of us now. Something prompted 20 years ago uh, when I saw the destruction of a mangrove forest. Mm -hmm. So that's really the, the practice. So as you can see, it's a social practitioner who um, evolved the practice as a way of trying to solve problems as opposed to learning about uh, a methodology or a modality to, to tackle it. Thank you. Um, I mean, I know I want to actually ask you many more questions, but I will ask a, a slightly different question. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, so, um, a key term, I mean, it might be coming from um, my sort of profession as an art historian, sure. in a way. So a key term defining socially engaged art or socially engaged practice is collaboration. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you about the relationship between authorship and collaboration. Because what I gleaned from the Xavier Cortada Foundation website is that Xavier Cortada is not just an artist, but also you're also kind of a brand or the, you know, you're, you're it in a way. So um, I think you, on the Cortada Foundation website, you're identified as the artist, uh, but also the founder and the artistic director. And I see many contemporary artists, in fact, actually taking the role of an artistic director in a way, conceptualizing, planning, designing, prototyping, and overseeing the making, but often with a team. And in, in terms of making, often with a group of fabricators and makers that might be contracted or hired. So uh, where does your authorship begin and end? Does it ever end? And who are the key collaborators in the, the making of art that you actually do with? I see that there are multiple st stages and trajectories in each project I've been admiring. So you, I really highly recommend going to his website and uh, seeing the whole like, big uh, group of projects that he's been doing. Uh, I'm sure that 
um, actors in each stage may not be identical and throughout, and I see that you have been engaging with many community members and volunteers. So can you explain a little bit more about your creative process further and how do you see this compared to also running a corporation, whether a business or a nonprofit organization like your foundation? So, sure, yeah. sure. So it's a great question. I want to be able to distill it. Let me, let me um, try to be as um, succinct as I can because I want to answer all of it. I believe that in our society, um, we do not understand the power that artists have. I really think that too often uh, artists uh, abdicate that, give it to a curator or to a collector or to a critic, and they um, diminish their role by doing that. I also understand that in broader society, people don't understand the nuances of what a social practitioner is. And when they think of an artist, they think as something you do with your hands and it has certain value and it's an object. So instead of trying to uh, appease, right, I am really um, uh, driven by ensuring that I model what the role of an artist is. Mm -hmm. And I fight within systems, within bureaucracies, within my university, within my government, and especially in my society, to assert that role and to try to inspire other artists to behave like mm -hmm. I do. And I know that sounds really self-absorbed, but as the immediate past chair of the Cultural Affairs Council of the third largest cultural hub in the United States, I know how uh, the art world operates. And I, I want artists to understand that they need to take control of their careers and their lives and their brand. They need to own it. They need to ensure that they are not creating art at the discretion of another institution, but that they ultimately hold the power. Through my eco art projects, I collaborated with a bunch of groups until it wasn't the priority of that nonprofit institution or museum or university. And that's why I decided to pivot and create my own foundation to be able to ensure that the purity of this idea, that the artist has a role, that art has a job to do, that problems need to be solved, and that you um, can't cower or subordinate those to the interests of uh, the very groups that you're trying to collaborate, because what you're actually trying to do is infiltrate and change those groups for the better good. So there's a, there's a whole practice to just my practice that I'm trying to model beyond the role that I'm trying to have in society. And it's really, thank you for, for noticing that because it, at parts of it feel contradictory, mm -hmm. but there is a purpose for it, and that is just trying to, trying to, to end this moment in history where greenwashing and a big interest and the delusion of truth and democracy is taking hold um, I know that in, in Shakespeare, the first thing we do is kill all the, the lawyers to try to, you know, uh, not deal with an order society. I think the modern day premise is the first thing you do is kill all the artists. That's how democracy dies. So what I want to make sure is to empower and give strength to the role of what it means to be an artist and not to have that be conditional upon having a donor or an or a, or a institution support the work you do. Thank you, and I, I realize we're actually sort of, we should actually get some audience questions, and uh, audience members are welcome to submit any questions using this uh, Slido link that you can use this uh, QR code. And I think you, we already have quite many questions that have come <laughs> in uh, from uh, audience members online, so I'll sort of, there are many questions I can't. Oh my gosh, I don't look think, at that. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> I don't think By we the way, can... I loved your question. Thank you. Oh. That was a really, I'm glad you, you pulled that out of me. That was a wonderful question. Thank well, you. thank you. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, well, there are just too many questions. I'm going <laughs> to just select a couple. <laughs> um, let's see. OK, so. Um, one of the audience members asked, art often needs time for reflection and self-examination to be resonant. Is this at odds with the dire urgency of the climate crisis? How to balance these? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I um, sure, I, I, th I think I, I'm, I'm very contemplative and all that, but I, 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 I don't want to lose sight of the urgency. 
And it's not as if we don't have solutions. I don't think I, I don't think I need, um, I, don't think a, I, don't, I don't think I need a more nuanced way to express what the problem is. What I think I need to do is create a platform for people to act. I think science communicators have the same thing. We're not here to try to find the science. We're trying to communicate it so that it resonates with people. So again, I, I have this urgency, and I have this role that I'm trying to do, and I, and I do believe, I do believe that our time, we're in the, you know, the middle of the 10th, well, we're in the middle of the hottest, well, you know, time in human history, right? Like, things are only getting worse. There are, I'm not gonna go into my whole spiel about what's happening to our Gulf Stream, what's happening to our warming planet and what's happening to our glaciers and our ecosystems. I mean, it is urgent. It, I mean, again, we're in this, we're lulled between Netflix and, and, and deceptive uh, practices. We're lulled into thinking that things are okay. It's a bright day outside, everything is fine when all of it is collapsing. And I think we need artists to help us show that. So contemplation is nice, you know, taking care of oneself is nice, but there's a, there's a time to act and that time is here and it is now. Thank you. So um, uh, another question about uh, sort of, so one, one more question. So can you please say more about how institutions and art spaces can help artists engage with subject experts and community in addressing these important issues? Yeah, look, I think, I think um, it, it talked about cultural mostly. Yeah. Look, I, I, think, I think cultural institutions have such an important role. They have the trust of our communities, right? They are valued pillars uh, in our community. And that trust is eroding before the very eyes, particularly among our millennials. I think that it is wise for our cultural leaders to understand that they need to engage in practices that model sustainability within their structures so that then that resonates to their board in the private sector and they can leverage the power of the private sector to begin to change the policy in their community. Secondly, I think that, you know, too often they're creating exhibits to either boost your ticket sales or to appease a critic. Again, that is, that to me is, is, is a, a very defeatist attitude. Again, as, as I said, I, I, I look at that as almost a self-preservation you know, uh, at, at a time when they have a bigger role to fill. So I, th I think in many ways the, the model of having art reflect or witness, as important as that is, uh, so that we become more aware, is a little, is a little uh, tired. I think uh, museums need to become laboratories. I think there needs to, um, mm. there needs to be ways where uh, the community doesn't feel uh, as if um, it is odd for them to be there. I think there has to be a more participatory, engaged nature to them. And I think that they need to model, they need to walk the walk. And eventually, all cultural producers will be talking of the same way that technology is anything everyone understands today. There'll be a point where there's nothing but climate in every stage, on every set. Like, climate will be the thing. You can't live life without understanding the impacts on climate. So I, I hope that just like minutes ago as we were out on the lawn and we all were gathered and watched the eclipse happen and all of us collectively understood that there was something important happening, I believe art can do that. I believe art can have us all focus and understand something bigger, helps us see things a little bit differently, and hopefully puts us in a rhythm that addresses the issue. And more than any sector, more than government, more than religion, more than academic institutions, right? I think art, the cultural sector, has a role. It's just not, it's not meeting the challenge. And they will be held accountable. Well, I mean, I, I think follow up on that is I see another question about how art and music and music education is under threat everywhere. So do you have any ideas about how to regenerate public support for art in schools? <sighs> Well, I mean, schools. I mean, schools are having their own crisis and issue. I'm in. I'm from the state of Florida, so we're we're you know, yeah. that's a, a whole conversation. By that, I I really mean the the debasement of public education. Uh, uh, but I look. I think I think to be able to 
release art and make art something that isn't the novelty, but it's something that everyone under, to, to, to be Joseph Boys like and understanding that each and every one of us is an artist. To engage in that social sculpting he talked about, to understand that that is literally our mission and our role, and to unleash that in every sector of society, and to validate and value and elevate and fund that, and not worry about having your art stars at your exhibits. To literally look at the value of creative pursuits, not through the lens of commodity, but through the lens of connection and change, is how we begin to solve this, and it's how we begin to save our cultural institutions and want to fund and support and advance that. And I think now more than ever, as we live in an imperiled world, as we live in a polarized, imperfect world, I believe that the arts can save us. Well, <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I have just one more question. I mean, I, I have many more questions, I can see but that. I will. Can I you will. save those for me? I'll answer them. <laughs> yes, I mean, just uh, yes, yeah. yes. But I will. I will just make a, ask a, a last question, a very simple question: How to make a local initi initiative go global? Hmm. I think how to make a local initiative go global. I um, look. I, th I think. I think. I think we want to to act. I think we all want to think globally. I mean, I think that's the whole point. So I have a couple of projects. One that diminishes the distance between us. It's called the longitudinal installation, where I try to have empathy by connecting to people suffering across the planet and standing in their shoes. It's a performance piece I create and replicate. Another one is uh, across time. I have mm -hmm. people write letters to the future to try to connect to someone not yet born and write them a letter as to why it is that you're writing to them, what you're seeing, who you are. So I think that it's, I think it's important to, to think globally, to think across space and time, to understand that we have in our bodies the same nucleotides that everything that lives, has ever lived or will ever live on planet Earth is made up of these same four nucleotides. So I, I think thinking globally, thinking of ourselves beyond our time on this planet is important. But I wouldn't be concerned about having global impact. I think it's about acting locally and thinking globally. And that's why I gave you a toolkit, so that you could bring the underwater to 1.3 and 2 point whatever. You bring the underwater. You do your project. You take it as a platform and run with it. So I think it's important for us to just be immersed. Just today at, at lunch, I was with a, a wonderful Harvard student who's going to go back to Oregon, because that's where she's from and she's going to try to, to help an environmental calamity that's happening in her community. That's where she needs to be. She doesn't need to be in Miami. She needs to be home where she's trusted and loved and has those relationships that she can build with other people in society to effectuate change. That is our role, and let's, let's not try to become art stars. Let's try to start a movement that can change our world and save our planet. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Xavier, for your talk, your creativity and passion, and for giving us a chance to make yard signs together, yeah, sure. and uh, for being with us today. So I will now invite Lynn Tomiklunagin um, Brown to back to the stage to close out our event. This is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> this will be very quick. Thank you, Xavier, and thank you, Gina, for that. It was fantastic. <laughs> And thanks to all of you for being here and sharing in this wonderful conversation today. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.